Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, my sermon is titled, The Gospel According to Abraham. And it was not by my own, like, fudging. I wasn't trying to do this purposefully. But as we've been going through the book of Genesis, we have come to a very important juncture, midpoint in Genesis, that truly, just, I'm so in awe of how God works out his timing, because, because the main points that we can see in Genesis chapter 22 actually coincides with the story of Easter. And so I just thought it was so amazing of God to somehow put these things together, and so I put it together by, by naming the title, The Gospel According to Abraham. And this morning, it's going to be, I know because we have a lot of people and we also have communion that we need to do afterwards, I just want to bring up three points that we see in Genesis chapter 23, uh, 22. Three points. Number one, we're going to see the revealing nature of tests. Why take tests and what is it for? And number two, we're going to see the result of our tests. And then finally, we're going to see the reward for obedience. So number one, the revealing of tests. Number two, the results of it. And number three, the reward for obedience. Let's open up our Bibles to the Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 2. If you don't have your Bibles this morning, that's okay. We have all the verses up on the PowerPoint for you to Follow, let's follow along and read carefully. This is God's word. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Right off the bat, in verse 1, we see the narrator of Genesis telling everyone what this was about. And it says that sometime later, God tested Abraham. He's already telling the audience that this is a test that God put to Abraham. Now, the question I want to ask each and every one of us is, what is the reason for tests? Now, I know some of you high school students, you can't stand tests, right? Oh, even the grade school students, I can't stand tests. And if you have to hear any more acronyms, you are just going to flip, right? Yes, the PSAT, the SAT, the LSATs, this, that, this, that, all these MCATs, all of these things. Why do we take tests? Why do teachers make you take tests? Yes. Yes, tests are given to show the teacher how much you know and how much you've learned. Yes. Oh, yes. That, okay, let's, man, you're going to be in finance someday, my young man. And so he said, Simon said, so that the school can get money. Yes, in the end, it is a lot about the money. Because the better the test scores, the more money is funneled through those certain schools. Yes, that is correct. Why do we practice sports? I don't know if you've ever had a sport that you played, but my, I played high school football, and my coach would make me do drills every single day. And you know what the funny thing is? Those drills were the same drills we would do over and over and over again. Suicides, running suicides. Anybody remember suicides? That is crazy, right? Why do we do that? And why, do we, why does the coach make us run these tests all the time? Because what our young man, what our fellow, what our fellow mate showed us today 
is that tests are there to reveal what's in our heart. Because by the time, the reason why we practice over and over again is so that we can literally have our brains memorize things so that by the time the test actually comes, you can pass succeedingly. The tests are there to reveal what's in our hearts. Tests are there to reveal what you know. And in the same way, look at what it says in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. It says here, remember, this is Moses speaking, and he says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness, the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart. Whether or not you would keep his commandments. Unfortunately for the Israelites in the time of Moses, they failed in their testing. According to Hebrews, it says that they failed in their testing because when the fire started to be lit under their bellies, meaning when the time started getting rough, when they started running out of food, when they started running out of water, the net result, what ended up coming out of their hearts? They started to complain. They started to get angry. And they started to have resentment towards God. Oh, God, I can't believe you brought us out here. This is terrible. How could you do this to us? That what was in their hearts. They weren't thankful. They weren't joyful. And they weren't appreciative towards God for what he was doing, and it came out when their faith was put to the test. In the same way, there are times where you and I will be tested in life. Now, I'm not saying all tests come from God, but in times of testing, what is going to be, what is going to be your posture? And depending on how you react to these tests of life is going to show you what's exactly in your heart. Children, you know. You know what it feels like. You know exactly how your parents are feeling when they come home and let's say they're angry. You're like, oh, okay, don't talk to mom. Don't talk to dad. Why? Because you know what's in their hearts. It's coming out, out of the overflow of their life. And in the same way, God is testing Abraham because he is trying to see what's going to come up out of his heart. And so what does come out of Abraham's heart? Well, let's read it. In chapter 22, it goes on in verse 6. It says, Abraham... Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. We continue in verse 9. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, saying, shouting, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. 
Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from him, from me, your son, your only son. Look at what it's saying in verse 12. Verse 12 summarizes exactly what was in Abraham's heart. What was really in his heart? Abraham was about to kill his own son and offer him as a sacrifice to God. What is the result of this test? The result is, look at what it says in the end. It says, do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld him. You have not withheld from me your son, your only son. What is this revealing about Abraham? It reveals that Abraham loved God more than he loved his own son. As difficult as that is. And remember, we've been going through this long journey in Genesis of from the promise that God gave to finally the fulfillment of the promise, which is his son Isaac. And now God is saying, give that back to me. And almost without hesitation, Abraham is willing to give back to God that which God gave him. The result of this test was that God had Abraham's full heart. There was nothing that Abraham was hiding from God. There is nothing that he wouldn't give to him. He offered, he was literally at the point where he was going to kill his son, and he says, stop, stop. Now I know that you love me, that you fear God, that you love me more than anything else. You know, this is, a, this is showing us priorities. What was Abraham's priority? Abraham's priority in life is now it's God and his commands. And by the, the way we act is going to show our priorities, the result of these test results. For example, let me, let me, let me share something really easy for all of you. Uh, have you ever, have you ever um, as a young kid, you ever had to do a performance or a musical or a play? Or maybe even you did a sport? I remember for me, uh, again, I played football in high school, and I always invited my parents to all of my games. Guess how many they came to? <laughs> Korean adults, come on, how many, how many? One. Yeah, zero. That, you guys are actually right on the money. They actually came once. They came once. Why? Because they had the dry cleaning business. They couldn't, they couldn't take their time away. Kids, you know what it's like when you ask your parents, Mom, Dad, can you come watch me sing? Can you come to my performance? And then you're performing out there, and you see where your parents are supposed to sit, and one of them's not there. What does that say to you? What does that say to you in your heart? It says to you that my parents had priorities that were greater than this performance that I invited them to, doesn't it? And it's painful when we see that. It's painful because you know by the way people act, that's exactly what they love. And we see it all the time in marriages. We see it all the time in relationships. For you guys, when you have boyfriend and girlfriend, and you know you guys are hanging out together, and all your significant one can do is just be on the phone, <laughs> and you're like, come on, don't you want to spend time with me? What? <laughs> you know? How does that make you feel? It doesn't make you feel good, right? Because you know that their priority is in something else other than you. And you are wanting that priority. 
Isn't that what we all want? We want to be loved. We want to be appreciated. We want to be connected with. But if they're doing everything other than what they're, what, you know, with you, then you feel disconnected. The greatest thing about Abraham and his sacrifice is that God gives him this gift. And instead of like a child that goes around in the other room and never says anything back to their parents and is playing with their toy or whatever, and it, they love the gift, Abraham turns around and he's actually facing God because he loves God more than he loves the gift. This is a priority issue, and Abraham is showing that his number one priority is God and God himself. His priority to God is so great that he would give his one and only son. That's how much we know Abraham loves God, that he would give his one and only son to back to God. What's God's priority? Have you ever asked that question? And it's a great question to ask on Easter Sunday. What's God's priority? Is God's priority today to save the whole world and bring world peace? It could be. But you know, John says it so distinctly in John chapter 3, verse 16. Look at what it says. 3.16, I, I, this, this verse never gets old for me. No matter how many times we hear it. For God so loved the world, us, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Do you know that this morning that God loves you, the world, us, all of us here, and all the people all over the world, he loves us so much that he would give his one and only son for you and I? That's how much he loves you. That he would sacrifice his only. It's not like he had 10 sons. It's not like he had 100 sons. God has only one son, his one and only. And look at what it says again. I know you fear God. I know you love me because you have not withheld from me your son and only son. Paul talks about this as he writes about how much God loves us. We should know the love of God because of his sacrifice. God's priority was you and me. It wasn't his son. If it was his son, he would never put him on the cross. But his priority was you and I, and so he gladly gave his son as a sacrifice to each and every one of us. And you know, the reason I entitled this, uh, this the sermon, The Gospel According to Abraham, if you look at all the things that God is doing here, telling Abraham and what Abraham is doing by putting the wood behind his son's back, it's a, it's a, it's a description of Jesus on the cross. Jesus had to have put his, the wood cross on his back and he walked it through, carried it through Calvary, just like Isaac is carrying the wood on his back. And furthermore, if you know Mount Moriah, where he is actually um, sacrificing his son, it's actually at the temple Jerusalem courts. It's only a stone's throw away from Calvary. A lot of the images you are seeing happening to Isaac and the sacrifice of Isaac is exactly what God does, sacrificing his son, Jesus, on the cross for you and I. So finally, after seeing that God, first of all, testing reveals what's in our hearts. Number two, the result of test is to let us know that God loves us. And number three, let's take a look at the third and last point. Genesis chapter 22, verse 15 through 18 says, The angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, 
that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. What is the result of obedience? Because Abraham was willing to sacrifice his one and only son back to God. God honors Abraham with the promise that he will bless Abraham and make his descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Now, has this promise been realized in Abraham's life? During his life? No. But in the timeline of God, we see God keeping his promise towards Abraham as a result of his obedience. Let's take a look at this. This is the Abrahamic monotheistic tree. This is interesting because it starts with the root of the tree, which is Abraham right here and Isaac. Now, Abra now Isaac is going to be Judaism, but remember, Ishmael is on the line of Islam. Look at all of the tree in which Abraham starts the tree at the root. Look at how many branches have come out of this tree. You have three major religions of the world come stem out of Abraham. You have Islam, Judaism, and Christianity, which, by the way, according to the Pew Research Center, did you know that these three religions make up more than 50% of the world today? More than 50%. Guys, that's like 7 billion people. That's like 3.5 billion people. More than 3.5 billion people. Has God kept his promise to Abraham? What would you all say? Yes, he has. God keeps his promises to his people. And one of the reasons why God tests his people is not only to see what's really in our hearts, but he wants to see, he wants to reward, the, the reward for obedience is that God's promises are fulfilled in the life of those who obey him. God's promises are fulfilled in the lives of those who who obey him. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 18. It says this about Jesus, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, it was very difficult for Jesus to obey God's command to go on that cross. And we know it was difficult because even the night before his crucifixion, he prayed to God, God, please take this cup away from me. But because Jesus obeyed God, look at the blessing in which he receives. Not only is he exalted from the highest place to the highest place, but he is given the name that is above every other Name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Guys, just as we see in Abraham's life, because Abraham obeyed God, God rewarded him with descendants as numerous as the stars in the skies and the sands on the seashore. And just like Abraham obeyed God, 
Jesus obeys God in going to the cross for you and my, for your and my sins. And what is the, what is the result of obedience? God blesses Jesus to be the highest name above all names. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, I am not going to try to lie to you and say obedience to God is easy. Uh, it's not. Actually, obeying God is really difficult because it's going to usually take a sacrifice and it's going to cost you something. But if I know God, I mean, if I have what I have read of God throughout this entire Bible is that one thing for sure is that when God makes a promise to you, he will keep it. Just as he has kept his promise to Jesus and just as he has kept his promise to Abraham by blessing them, God keeps all of his promises. But it is very difficult to obey God. And I know because when I had to make the choice to obey God, follow my life that I love, or follow God and his commands, I will tell you, every single time I've chosen my way, it always has ended in disaster, always. But when I follow God's prompting and what he says, and I obey him, it's always turned into blessing, always. I have never seen a time in my own life where I have obeyed God and I have regretted it. But there are many times in my life where I have obeyed myself. I followed my own ways, and I've always regretted it. I pray this morning, this Easter Sunday morning, as we see how God, how Abraham responded to God's testing, I pray that you and I would be encouraged this morning to know that God keeps his promises and that he will bless you in his way when we obey his commands. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, sometimes the things you ask of us is so difficult and sometimes seem so crazy at times. It is very difficult, honestly, to obey you. But God, I pray that we would find encouragement this morning, Father, that following you and obeying you is actually the greatest thing we can do. Father, reveal to our hearts this morning what's really in our heart. Father, do we want to obey you? Do we want to live by your statutes and your rules and the way you have life planned out for us? Lord, I pray that we would be able to come to a place ultimately in life where we surrender our all to you, just as Abraham surrendered his all, knowing that your promises are always sure and that you will fulfill them in your time. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.